Hello, sisters. Okay, do that thing again where like it starts to live and it's like nine seconds. How is it now? It's, okay, hello, sisters. The time just jumped. It was like nine seconds. Now it's three seconds. Like, I don't know. Okay. It was so like shocking. Okay, I have these like coasters, which my friend bought me for Christmas. They're about like a female indigenous Canadian artist whose name I forgot. Um, I have these coasters, which I obviously put my Diet Coke on. And then when I was reading, I lifted up my Diet Coke and it was like stuck to it with condensation. It like fell to the ground. It was like, bang. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Um... So, we read the essay. My main thought is that I was actually too tired to do this today and I kind of want to like mulligan, like cancel and do it again. However, I have a very, very busy life. Like five days a week, I have two jobs and I work. This week, I'm only working six days a week. Usually I work in the last month or so, seven days a week. So when I make the schedule, I'm like, you have to freaking follow the schedule unless you have like a headache or a migraine, you have to, because if I don't, then I will just constantly be like, I'm too tired and never do it. So unless I'm like falling asleep because I got two hours of sleep, I try to keep on the schedule, even if I'm tired, it might mean that like my analysis or reading is not up to what I want it to be, but it's like either I do it or don't do it. So I have to like, you know, make a compromise. Um... Hello, Charlie. Hello, kitty cat. Oh my god, this fucking camera. No. Focus. Nope. Focus. I don't understand why my camera is always going out of focus like this. Okay, well there. All right, so first note, very tired. Um, this is not about the essay specifically, but you know, these discussion streams are always pretty like free. Um, I'm starting a different feminist project, which is gonna take up part of the time that I used to stream on live like on on youtube once a week starting next week and then i'm starting a feminist course with jane claire jones at the um center for feminist thought also next week which is for 10 weeks and i'm so fucking excited because it gives you like kind of like a history history and like critical analysis of like how feminism evolves and got to where it is and like how women constructed some of like the core concepts of feminist thought um which is super fucking cool however the average reading per week is like 70 or 80 pages of essays so or excerpts from books so as a result i have like and for that i'm not just reading casually i'm like taking notes and stuff you know like there's like work to do coursework to do so um as a result from now on, I will be streaming only once a week, I think. Uh, yeah, just, it's not really feasible to work six or seven days a week, like 50 hours a week, do that other feminist project, do that course, and then also stream here on YouTube three days. It's like not fucking possible. So from now on, I think I will only be streaming on Fridays. Um, and then last night I was talking to my friend. <laughs> And I was like, you know, I'm like reading all these feminist essays, um, like not these ones, like the ones for my coursework. And I'm like, I keep having all these ideas. Like I should just start like Substack and start writing. She's like, when? When? You have no time. Like you're not even like barely sleeping. Like you don't have, don't do anything else. I was like, fair enough. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Kitty cat. I feel like I've tried to like do that thing where I like enable people to link, um, like URLs or web pages or whatever, but then YouTube doesn't like it. So if you email it to me right now, I can put it into the live chat like right now. My email is gnccentric at gmail.com. Okay. And if I don't remember to go check my email, like tell me. Okay. So I'm not going to give like a broad summary of the essay or anything like that because I really feel like I only absorbed like 60 or 70% of the essay. Um, yeah. But I'm going to give you some of my random thoughts about it. 
my main thought. Well, I guess let's let's like glance through the essay. It was pretty long, also. Um, I couldn't get over like like two and a half pages of notes. I was like, whoa. Okay. Um. Well, one of my thoughts. I mean, I'm not going to give you like a main. Because sometimes I'll be like, this is my main thought, and these are like my other thoughts. No, I'm just going to give you random thoughts I have. One of my thoughts is that she goes after um, postmodernism or like post-constructuralism or whatever in like a round, like in a sideways, like incidental way in this essay, like she does in so many of the essays in this book. And she uses, like, I wonder what she would think of this, like, if I if I was able to talk to her face to face um, about it, because she uses the example of Foucault, where she's like, Foucault deconstructing, like, the categorization of sexualities has not resulted in, like, no more queer bashing, right? So deconstructing the concept of race is not going to, like, destroy racism, because, like, intellectual conceptions have very little impact on like the rules by which we live as a society that are based on the concept, like the societal conceptions we already have. I was like talking, yeah. Um, but actually it's gotten, as you may or may not know, general homophobia has like gone up in the last couple years. And a lot of the research that's done about that points to the fact that deconstructing the concept of sexualities and gender identities has made everything so like wishy-washy and incomprehensible that the average person I think is like more suspicious and confused by it than ever before. And as a result, they have more like bias against it, which like makes sense to me. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I know, right, kitty cat. Uh, right, so let's go ahead and go through this. Um, well, one of my thoughts was that we, I need to reread on being white because I don't remember the specifics of it. Um, there are some essays like by her, like where she mentions like seasoning, which is like how sex traffickers like mentally break down their slaves. Um, and she compares that to like the socialization women get to enter into this institution of heterosexuality. There's some essays or like the arrogant eye, which talks about how like man basically is having a God complex and because of his power and the fact that other men listen to him, he almost like embodies the God complex like into reality and women have the opposite, like a kind of like mirror of that where we view ourselves as being powerless. And so are, I don't know, there's just, there's essays by her. My point is that there's essays by her that when I'm reading other feminist stuff or I'm even like reading like Reddit post or something, like I think about, I think about those essays. On being white, I guess I don't interact that much about like with content that's like anti-racist or something but I just I haven't thought about it because I haven't had stuff that's like oh remember that essay so I kind of forgot what's in the essay actually so I need to go back and read it um oh yeah another thing is like two of these three books that she mentions are books that I actually have like on my to read list and as you know if you're a long time viewer I'm always like this is the next book we're gonna read and then right before we start I like change my fucking mind as you've noticed we were supposed to read like this politics on the margins I don't know not politics, something, something about Canadian women's politics was what we're going to read next. But then I started reading it and it's really about like statecraft, federal politics in Canada. And I was like, we shouldn't read that because it'll be boring to you guys. So then we're reading the history of Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, which are like the mothers of lesbian activism in the US in the 1950s. Um, next, because uh, also I thought that'd be like less like intellectually exhausting for me with uh, all this course work that I have now. But then my friend, who's Canadian, was like, so you don't want to read about, like, federal party politics in Canada in the 80s um, in this book because you think your readers won't care about it? She's like, would an American ever have that attitude? And I was like, no. And she's like, you should fucking read it. And I was like, okay. Which <laughs> is, like, true. An American would never be like, we shouldn't talk about feminism in, like, the years of Kennedy because, like, like American would never think that. So I should... I, I'm gonna read that book eventually. My point is, sorry, as you can tell, I'm tired because my like fucking run on sentences and not getting to my point. Um, 
I do want to read this bridge called my back because there is no audio of it. And as you know, my purpose is to kind of make things that are like inaccessible, more accessible. Obviously this bridge called my back, you can find a PDF online, it's easy to find, um, which in the, one of the links, I think it's in the, the feminist library link, like the last to the third link in my description. Um, you can find it, but I mean, make things accessible in terms of like, does it seem intimidating to you? Like, let's talk about it kind of thing. Um, but every time, and also bell hooks, I, there's, there's a handful of authors that I think are so prolific that I'll probably never read them on the channel. For example, Mary Daly, bell hooks, Audre Lorde, like all of their stuff is like in publication right now. It's like in course material in university classes. Like it's, there are a lot of like random people who've read those books. So I'm like, I don't think that they're like kind of less accessible. So they'll probably never be on my channel. But whenever I'm like, okay, it's time to talk about like race things. It's time to like consider like womanism or like maybe let's talk about like the history of the Kambahi River Collective, like black black women separatists or like whatever. I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. But you don't understand enough about like the concept of like separatism or like, wait, wait, wait. You don't understand enough about like the history of the formation of the feminist movement and how it like splintered. Like every time I'm like, let's talk about race specific stuff in feminism. My mind, like I'll, I'll glance at it and I'll be like, oh, but you don't know enough about this yet to have like a, a background context for having a commentary on it. And I'm like, I don't know if it's like, a manifestation of my insecurity of discussing race things or if I genuinely because like right now if you've been following me for a few years basically all we talk about is like philosophy slash theory and like lesbian history right and I feel like these are topics that I can comfortably talk about I would not for example pick up a book about surrogacy tomorrow and be like this is what we're reading because I don't feel like I know enough about it to have like strong opinions on it either way I know, I know an amount, but I don't feel confident to feel like an authority on it. Um, my point is, she is like, let's fucking talk about race. Because one of her things about the rules of whiteliness is basically that it should be unquestioned, as far as I understood the essay. And so she's like, by even questioning, like, the culture, the culture. What's the word I'm looking for? The paradigm in which whiteliness is the absolute, the unquestionable, the dominant. By even questioning it and talking about it and trying to understand it, we're kind of breaking the rules. So she's like, let's do that. So I'm like, I think next year when I start my new season, uh, I will try, I think, to read this bridge on my back. The other thing is I think that book is like fucking gigantic. I think it's like 500 pages or something like that. I might be confusing it with a different book. But there's also um this book, which is edited by Patricia Hill Collins, which is in my coursework parts excerpts from it it's called like black feminist thought and parts of it are really at least the parts that I've read are really good because it talks about um kind of like philosophical theory of like feminist concepts but like from the black woman's perspective um and so because of what I've been studying now I feel like I have context to like understand it and like interact with it intellectually you know what I mean so um Mel says, what's that saying? Speak even if your voice shakes. Yeah. Um, so I think we're just going to have to like grapple with it. I'm trying to, so right now, the next book, I mean, we finished this book. The next book we're going to read is um, Mel says, even though you may think, because I think you're pretty informed, you're not informed enough about race. I think you you should add your perspective. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'm going to eventually. I guess it's just like the courage to step into that. Uh, what was my point? Oh yeah, I'm trying to plan out. So as my longtime viewers know, I have like a seasonal usage of social media. So I think I'm going to be here until the first week of June. My goal is to finish the Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon lesbian slash woman book by then. Don't know if that's realistic. I think when I when I start a book on my channel, I make all the thumbnails and I cut up the chapters if they're too long. So I think it's going to be like 24 readings. As of right now, I think I will get like three quarters of the way through the book before my hiatus begins, which is like when I go to a place with no internet. So um, I don't know if we'll finish it by then. But um
Yeah, I I think when we do start talking about reproductive technologies, we're going to kind of do it in a chronological order. We're going to start with The Mother Machine by Gina Correa, which I've read excerpts of, but I haven't read the whole book. And I will forever fucking kick myself. I was in a used bookstore in Seattle like two years ago, and I picked up Mother Machine, and it was like 10 fucking dollars. And I was like, oh, this book is so prolific and so historically like important. Of course, I'll find it again. I'm flying. I can't take extra books with me. And it was like fucking skinny and small. It was like smaller than this. And I was like, I can't justify bringing more books with me on the plane when I have, you know what I mean? And I didn't pick it up. And since then, I have been on the fucking search for this book and I cannot fucking find it. Anyway. um, But that's the book we're going to read first just because it's older. Oh, that's also older. You ha Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. I guess we're not really talking about the fucking essay. So I guess I'm like doing whiteliness. Uh, no, we're going to talk about the essay. Yes. Uh, Mel, email me. So the last couple of weeks, uh, I've been like posting on Twitter about my feminist library, like showing pictures of what I have and like the kind of categories, like my section about like, like language, like feminist language. Uh, it only has two books in it. And I'm like, that's not enough. My section about like women's health. It only has two different editions of our bodies ourselves, not a first edition, which obviously I want. Um, and this book about like lesbian health, which is like Canadian. Um, I'm like three books about women's health. That's not enough. Like every copy, I, every category of books, I'm like, I need more. Right now, what I'm really on the lookout for is Common Lives, Lesbian Lives, which was um, a feminist quarterly. And I can't find digital copies of it anywhere. Even if you try to look on like websites that have like um, listings of like books, I can't even find like how many actual editions of it there were, like how many volumes were published. Like it's such a like intangible thing. I know it exists because I've read women on Instagram or Tumblr, like posting pictures of essays from it. So I've read some of the essays from it, but I I want to own Common Lives, Lesbian Lives and I want to put it on here. I When I got a copy of um, For Lesbians Only, I was like, this book is like fucking feminist gold to me at least let's put it online then women were like it's for you know it's for um lesbians only so like it's kind of antithetical to put it online and I was like yeah and then one woman was like you should read common lives lesbian lives if you're trying to like share like the lesbian experience lesbian culture lesbian history like which is kind of what I wanted to do with, like for lesbians only because it has like a chronology of like lesbian consciousness and separatism and then like kind of tackles issues about it um and I was like, yes, I would love to do that. Where the fuck do I get copies of that? Um, yeah, anyway. So let me give you my email. I've been posting about this stuff on Twitter. And as a result, I've been mailed multiple books. Yes, okay, one second. Where do I to the fucking... That is my email. So um, email me. The title, it's like, um, it's like one of those, it's like Sinister Wisdom or like Lesbian Ethics, like a kind of thing that was published like four times a year with like essays. And I think like those things, they would have like discourse in the book where like, you know, one woman would be like the history of butch femme is like significant. Another woman would be like butch femme is like the patriarchy and they would like go back and forth like throughout the, I think it's that kind of thing. Um, You know, I don't know why I didn't consider universities. Um, I have a couple of friends who are in different universities, not close to me, but maybe they can access copies of it that I could use or scan or something. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, so all this to say, trying to plan next year's books. Usually we can get through about three books a year, depending on size. Like this book is not huge. Um, I planned out reading for lesbians only it would have taken me i think 96 weeks or something to read it because it's like fucking it's like 550 pages or something um so next year i don't know man there's so much philosophy i have like three different feminist philosophy anthologies that i want to read um because i just fucking love feminist philosophy as you've no. Um, 
But I do want to read Dworkin. I think my thing is going to be I'm going to read at least one Dworkin a year until we're all done. Because in general, those are the videos that bring people to my channel. Like, all of all the feminist reading I've done on my channel, Dworkin's books are the ones that get people to, like, come to my channel and be like, oh, what's this? And then they start looking at my other videos, as far as I can tell from the way YouTube analytics tells me things. So, also just, like, her books are so fucking good. Um, that would take forever. Correct, Kitty. I'm not stopping. I'm doing this for, like, the next 25 years. Like, I don't have anything else better to do than talk about feminist literature, to be honest with you. Um, and also... There's nowhere to like formally study it. I mean, I'm taking this feminist course, but like when that's done, there's like there's like three kind of courses. I'm taking two of them now and then I'll take the third course after. And then what? There's no like there I can't do like a master's in like second wave like sex wars or whatever. Like I there's nowhere else for me to study this shit. So like this is me studying feminism or trying to at least, I don't know. Um I really should have done like a life update stream rather than doing all of this in the stream about this because we're talking for 20 minutes. We haven't really talked about the essay. It's because Dworkin is synonymous with radical feminism. Yeah, she is like the most well-known radical feminist at this time. Um, which is unfortunate because there's like, not that I don't love her, but there's a lot of really good radical feminist um, writers that are, I think, overlooked. Um... Like, I hope for most women, like, when they come to my channel, they're like, oh, Dworkin. And then they see all my other readings and they're like, oh, I'll click on something else. Like, I hope. I don't know. Um, yeah, so next year, we're definitely going to read a different Dworkin. I don't know which one. I'm thinking Letters from a War Zone or Woman Hating. But uh, maybe we should just jump on it and read This Bridge Called My Back. But... I really do want to read The Mother Machine because since two years ago, I can't fucking stop thinking about it. And also, in my, like, friend group, we actually talk a lot about, like, the ethics of um, gamete donation. Not surrogacy specifically, but, like, the ethics of, like, the politics involved in, like, who's donating what, who has knowledge about what, who has power over what. And, like, I know that these were like kind of some of the things they grappled with very early on before they knew what was going to happen. And now here we are like 50 years later, 45 years later. This mother machine is like 1983 or something, right? And uh, we see now that like the ethics of how women are impacted by this stuff is like very bad. So kind of three books, maybe this bridge called our back mother machine and something by Dorkin probably next year. Um, if only I had the time to read five days a week. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, Kitty Cat, you're Canadian. Are you in the fucking... Are you in that collective from BC? Dude, fucking email me. Wait, also, did you email me about the um link I'm going to put up? Where is it? What fucking email am I using? Like 75,000 emails. Um, this is the right email. This is GNC Center. Okay. Anyway. Anyway. Okay. Another thing I want to do is like start a lesbian collective. Like who has the fucking time? Okay. Let's talk about the actual fucking essay now. So, she mentions books that I was like, I want to read those books. Um, So one of the things, are you in a lesbian collective or a feminist collective? Because the one I'm thinking of is a lesbian collective. But dude, fucking email me. There is a chance that in the next 12 months, I will be in Vancouver. So like, let's hang out, obviously. Okay. Um, one of the things she covers in the introduction basically is that like, White women, it's my understanding, thinking in circles, talking in circles with each other is kind of self-indulgent and not very fucking productive. Um, 
she says it's like, we consider it to be working with ourselves, but actually what we're doing is playing with ourselves. So she, one of the things she says is like, racism is our problem, not their problem. Um, this is something that I used to come across a lot when I was like into liberal feminism was kind of like, how are we supposed to like undo our racist ways of thinking? And oh my fucking God, it's already one. Um, how are we supposed to undo our racist ways of thinking and behaving without um, without exploiting like the labor and energies of um, like you know women of color or black women? Um, and I used to think about that a lot and kind of think it was a bit paradoxical. But here she's like, you can fucking do it very easily. I think it's more towards the end of the essay where she's like, observe what they say to each other listen when they fucking talk about things in general rather than like interviewing and demanding answers and read their fucking writings right on like that could at least be a starting point like obviously it's what I intend to do um but <sighs> not to like speak for women of color as a whitely woman, but like, I'm pretty sure if I was like, I have read all these texts by and about women of color and I have thought a lot about it. And like, I think my position on things has changed over the years and I've tried to like do things to be anti-racist. Can I ask you a question about things that I've thought or whatever? They would be much more open to it than being like, I've never really thought about it except for what other white women tell me. So like explain everything to me from scratch. I don't know, at least, like, I feel like we should put some fucking effort into it. Um, another thing that she brings up, well, let's, okay, wait, let's, let's go in chronological order. So the introduction, she basically is like, let's stop thinking and talking in circles and, like, actually do something. Oh, I'm going to read the last paragraph of the introduction. I found it very interesting. Some white women report that the great enemy of their efforts to combat their own racism is their feelings of guilt. That is not my own experience, or that is not my word for it. The great enemies in my heart have been the despair and the resentment which come with being required by others and by my own integrity to repair something apparently irreparable, required to take responsibility for something apparently beyond my power to effect. Both confounded and angry, my own temptation is to collapse, to admit defeat, and retire from the field. What counteracts that temptation for me seems to be little more than willfulness and lust. I will not be broken, and my appetite for women's touch is not, thank goodness, thoroughly civilized to the established categories. But if I cannot give up and I cannot act, what do will and lust recommend? The obvious way out of that, sorry, the relentless logic of my situation is to cease being white. So, she's being a bit abstract here. I don't think she means lust in the literal sense. I don't think she means cease being white in the literal sense. She's, you know, being abstract. So, this is something too that um, when I've spent time on women's land and you hear the old woman talking about like the consciousness raisings and like um, struggle sessions and stuff where they try to like confront race issues in their own community, like in person, face to face at the time, the concept of guilt really comes across whether they're mentioning it or not, where they basically are like, we were trying to do our best and it wasn't enough. And like, what else do you fucking expect me? Like they, it, it's like the guilt leads almost like indignation. Yes, lust is impassioned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's like compassionate about women. Like when she means like the touch of a woman, she doesn't mean literal. She, she means like connection. Like that's how I read it. Like she's passionate about being connected to and like not cut off from other women. That's how I read that section. Um. So yeah, this guilt thing comes across a lot. I think it's like really thought stopping and leads to like, Oh, fuck, what were we reading? There's one of the essays in this where, is it Mary Daly? Which also, I fucking, at least on language, I need to read some of Mary Daly stuff like, whenever I'll get around to it. Rediscovering Fire? It was, yes, it was in this Rediscovering Fire essay. She talks about, like, these emotions that are, like, oh, what the fuck was the... No, this is the wrong essay. It's so short.
plastic passions. Okay, well, anyway, in the review of Pure Lust by Mary Daly, she, um, Marilyn Fry mentions, like, the plastic passions, which are, like, um, emotions that stop you from acting. And she's like, these are the emotions that stop you from acting. Guilt. Despair. Like, I don't know. There was, like, a list of them, but I can't remember. But I remember guilt was on the list. And she was like, these are emotions that you're told are, like, just as significant as other emotions but actually these emotions all lead to like a, a stopping of action and like stopping action is like the antithesis of creating being and creating space for women and like doing feminism so she's like all these emotions are something to be like aware of and be conscientious of and like when you feel these emotions you should as far as i understood the essay step back and analyze where did that come from because if you understand where that come from the real emotion behind it will lead you to take action and do something useful and proactive, practical and like creative and helpful to women rather than the like plastic passion, which is like a cover for the true emotion. So in this essay, she's like, guilt is a problem with white women confronting racism. And so my question is like, what is the guilt, the, the like cover for like, what is it hiding? What is it masking? Masking is the word before. What's it masking? And um, what she goes on to say is basically, as far as I understood the essay, like she doesn't she doesn't make like a linear argument, but having read the essay in its entirety, what I think she says in the essay is um, white guilt is a mask for two things. The first thing is um acknowledging the true suffering of white women because she never says this or even implies this but having read that whole essay now what I think she's talking about is that if white women can look at women of color and say like well they have it worse they can be in denial about their own suffering a state of like you know the bad state that they're in so by being like guilty for not being as bad off as them it like masks that like it, the other thing that she says explicitly is like insecurity so she mentions this like in multiple different ways she approaches this kind of insecurity this whole um what is it mini bruce pratt or something like that um where she's like you know as like christian white christians from the south we were taught to like be the arbiters of right and wrong and like enforce that right and wrong to those around us like we had like a moral duty to do that because we were taught it was right and wrong we have the moral duty to enact that and enforce that um and she's like, if you were taught that and you're now being told the things that you were taught were right and wrong, don't apply anymore or were incorrect. And you still have the like instinct that you need to like enforce what's right and wrong and like educate other people about what's right and wrong and like make people do the right thing. But you don't know what that's based on. Then all you're left with is like insecurity and confusion. So I think that the guilt thing, again, is like a mask for like insecurity and confusion. Um and so I think Mary Daly was onto something. I mean, when I read that, the first, when I read like the Mary Daly um, review, like what is it, essay seven or something, I was like, oh, like I kind of get it, but like it was all theoretical. Now having read this, I was like, oh, like literally like it leads to be. Um, I, it's kind of, I was kind of confused when I saw this was the last essay of the book. Um, just based on the title, I was like, it's kind of a big topic to cover, but actually it's like perfectly placed in the book. Because also the last essay we read was lesbian ethics, where she's like, why ethics? Why do we need to be the arbiters of right and wrong and just like realign what's right and wrong within patriarchy to basically like mirror what they're already doing and say that we know better? Um, she basically is like, let's not mirror black and white, right, wrong thinking. This is like my very dumbed down understanding of the essay of lesbian ethics. She's like, instead, let's ask questions about where are our values? What are our principles? What behavior should that lead to? What consequences should that lead to? And how is that different from the state we're actually in? She's like, let's think of ethics in like a broader sense rather than like this kind of like westernized Christo-European sense, my understanding of the essay. So to read that essay and then to read this directly after makes a lot of fucking sense because 
she's like she states this like multiple times in the I think it's the contingency of racedness and in the what's the next section after this? Yeah, in the contingency of racedness where she's like all these white feminist women are trying to like do good, do the right thing, but they don't know what the good or the right thing is. So they fall into like two positions. One position of like deciding what the good or the right thing is with regards to race and therefore being like really condescending and domineering and it's not helpful or like deciding they don't fucking know and standing back and doing nothing and just distancing themselves from it. Um, and also what she mentions um, in uh, the review of Mary Daly when Mary Daly is trying to kind of like, I think it's the word race or the word racism. She's trying to kind of like defang it. Mary, she basically explains that Mary Daly thinks this word is very like intimidating to women. So we need to like kind of like play with it and touch it and like interact with it in a way that we can like really grapple with the word rather than like hearing it and having like a kind of gut instinct of like, oh, that's bad. Like to kind of like have a deeper understanding of it. She's like, by doing that, Mary Daly has actually done a disservice by making it like instead of like a, anyway, she's critical of Mary Daly doing that. But here she is like, one of the problems is that since white supremacy is a social structure that exists in like most of the Western world and is entrenched in our rules and like social contracts and legislation and stuff like that by doing nothing you are just letting it happen so this seems to be like her thesis in almost everything she writes do something creative do something out of the box try doing something different and you'll probably accomplish something rather than nothing um yeah i think that's like i like that a lot um at the same time though while reading this <laughs> i mean she is like she's quoting um different black uh black people from the dry longzo and she's they're like all white people do is sit around and think instead of sit around and talk like they think they're such authorities on things and i'm like well aren't we kind of trying to be authorities by sitting around talking with each other about this i don't know we do what we can i guess so Yeah, she has all of these uh, quotes from these books, which makes me be like, we need to read the fucking books. Maybe not this Draw Long Soak, it's got guys in it. No offense. But like, you know, not doing that shit on my channel. Um, There's something else that, like, generally she talks about in the essay, which I found, like, I'm glad she articulated it because it's something I've kind of, I guess, has come to thought to me, but I haven't really, like, conceived of it as, like, one whole thing. So when we were talking about lesbian ethics, and also in general when I've been talking about, like, gender-critical anti-feminists and liberal anti-feminists, I'm, like, one of the things that we as radical feminists should have and do have is like humility and the ability to like self-question and challenge each other and that is like one of the things i think that gives us our strength and she is like if you are brought up in this like christo american concept that you are like the arbiter of good and bad and you have to go out and enact it and then you're told like race is a problem then your instinct is to be like okay i'm gonna like redesign what's good and bad and go out and enact that to like solve racism she is like, what was the word I just read here? I thought I was like, that's the right word. Right. The attitude of infallibility is like a huge fucking problem because, I mean, when you think about, I'm going to try to bring this back to like modern stuff now. When you think about like diversity stuff, like equity and inclusion officers and like um, diversity, like I'm thinking of, a friend of mine at her job they had like a in-person like diversity workshop thing and she told me that like since moving to Canada that was the most racism she ever experienced was in that fucking workshop on how not to be racist like she's like a woman of color <laughs> and she was like so thinking about this like the infallibility of like the white approach to race 
often they get it wrong, which is not surprising. And I think most of that is because they're not willing to challenge themselves. They're not willing to question how they got where they got. They're not willing to be humble and like to say, I don't know, or I know something, but I don't know why I know that or how I got there. Like they're not willing to be humble, not willing to question themselves, not willing to challenge themselves. And most of all, they're not willing to listen to women of color. Now, when I say that, I'm sure you've seen women of color saying stuff that you consider to be like, especially with like trans shit, right? Where you're like, that's completely racist. And you're saying that to like prop up, um, you know, this postmodern concept that you like something else, right? Um, and this draws me back a lot to the um, essay of the like heterodox community in this book, where she is like, Fuck, okay, also, guys, like, in this last weekend, I drove probably, like, 17 hours, and throughout that 17 hours, I was listening to, like, essays by feminists. I think I've read, like, fucking 45 essays this weekend, so my brain is, like, exploding trying to remember who I'm trying to reference. I can't fucking remember, but basically, anyone doing something different and outside the rules and outside the expectations is probably doing something at least a little bit helpful. So when when she talked in this essay about like listening to black women or black, I mean, she doesn't say black women, she says black voices or something. Um, what I think about too is that I'm like, a lot of what's happening in modern times to like combat racism seems to be like, One of my good friends um, is black and she's very critical of like these like career activist types. And you will see the people who, who like have these like diversity workshop trainings that they like go into like Fortune 500 companies and they train them not to be racist. Or like these people who like do like speaking events at universities and stuff. It's like their entire job. And you might notice that they're all saying the exact same thing in the exact same way. And so when I think about like listening to what black women have to say about racism or women of color have to say about racism, I'm like, they're not a fucking monolith. So why is it that all of the like messaging we receive year in the year 2024 about how to like fix the problems, which obviously is not really fucking working if you've like seen the world, uh, seems to all be the exact same shit from the exact same angle. I'm not saying that like it has no merit. I'm just saying like, if, like, if you're going to listen to lesbians on a topic, you would hear a multitude of, like, a variety of different opinions and different values and different approaches. So I don't think that by, like, all in the year 2024 following the same, like, career activists who are saying the exact same things over and over again, that that's, like, listening to, like, people of color on large because they're all socially sanctioned it's kind of like um at the beginning of this s of this book i think it was the second essay where she talks about being a lesbian in the academy and she's like the fact that the academy lets me speak and bolsters me as like a radical who's like changing things up um actually should lead you to question if i'm that radical because the fact that i'm in the academy and I'm now like socially sanctioned to say what I have to say, you know, is it actually radical? Because if it was, it would be a threat to them. So it's like the same kind of thing. It's like if if what people are saying in the year 2024 right now, what is like the most like socially prolific like ideas about it are all socially sanctioned. Why are they socially sanctioned? Because white people are spreading it around. If white people are spreading it around, is it actually a threat to us? You know what I'm saying? I'm like I just basically am thinking like we need to like have more variety and like multitude. And I don't think that when people are like, I listen to what black and brown people have to say about racism in America or whatever, that they're actually listening to like a variety of different perspectives. Cause like, I mean, even like among lesbians shit, I'm a hundred percent sure that what we're about to read from Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon is going to be like offensive to what 
other stuff that we've read because they're for like a different time period a different background and they had like different goals and like that's good we should read stuff that clashes with each other so that we can kind of like challenge ourselves to think differently and like come to like our own conclusions anyway um Kitty says, I don't think adding black and brown to the pride flag ended racism. Wow, what a radical take that um, <laughs> is. Uh, Kitty says, it's PR for the system to appear more pal palpable and not what it really is, which can't be tweaked into political, into being ethical because it's based on exploitation too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which also, when she's talking about, I don't know which essay it was, I think maybe the lesbian in the academy or whatever. She basically is talking about like tokenism. Like, I think a lot of what's going on right now is actually tokenism and doesn't help anyone to do with race politics, at least the way I view it. Cause I'm like, not that I'm like an authority on race, but at like at a very basic level, if I look at like the state of like race issues in Canada from when I graduated high school to now, which is like 10 years, I don't see any huge differences. So, you know, anyway, okay, let's keep going. This fucking camera, stop going out of focus. I also was supposed to like, fuck, I was having like a meeting like 20 minutes ago, okay. What Lena's in class? Oh yeah, TLDR. Basically, she's middle class. A lot of people talking about this are middle class, so it might come across that this is a middle class issue, but it's not. Also, that the average person enacting white privilege, um, is middle class, and so it makes sense for those of lower class to like mirror and imitate them in an attempt to like be seen as having the same amount of authority and dominance. Like, yeah. Um, feminism and whiteliness. Okay, there was like one paragraph in here that I was like, we need to fucking read this. Oh, this. This is um from Doris Davenport. I'm going to read this um, quote and then I think we're going to wrap up the stream because it's been way too fucking long. All right. From Doris Davenport. A few of us third world women see beyond the so-called privilege of being white and perceive white women as very oppressed and ironically invisible. It would seem that some white feminists could see this too. Instead, they cling to their myth of being privileged, powerful, and less oppressed than black women. Somewhere deep down, denied and almost killed, is the psyche of racist white feminists. There is some perception of their real position, powerless, spineless, and invisible. Rather than examine it, they run from it. Rather than seek solidarity with women of color, they pull rank within themselves. Okay, so I guess that this is kind of explicitly stated what I said a few minutes ago. So she's like, they're intimidated, intimidated by the reality of their situations. They'd rather close their eyes to it and look down on us and be like, it's worse off for you guys. Um, if some of you follow me on Twitter, um, I have been accused of being racist, <laughs> which like, you know, probably is true. But the reason is that like every single fu fucking time, I follow a lot of like ex-Muslim women and like women from North Africa and stuff like that, who are like feminists online. Um, or even women from like, um, what is Malaysia and Indonesia, like, I don't know, places where Korean women, Japanese, I try to follow women from all over the world, it's my fucking point. And so a lot of these women will go on like little rants and tirades, or even about like men in their community and how the men treat them or treat their sisters or whatever, um, or like the situation that their mother is in or something like that. And other, other than rants, some of them will just be like, oh, my friend is in, like, this really bad situation. What can I do to help her? And, like, the way they're describing it is, like, fucking horrific. Oh, particularly, um, I follow a couple of Pakistani women who talk about, um, like, within their, within their country that there's, like, all this, like, like religious tension between, like, um, Hindus and Muslims. And that often, whatever side you are on, like, ethnically, the fact that there are, like, the two sides is weaponized against women regardless of which side they're on so they're like oh you need to do this because it like conforms to our like our culture so if you're not doing this it's because you're like on the other bad people's side but also like i don't know just like every way you position it it fucks women over and so i often tweet stuff that's like yeah you know like fuck those men in those countries fuck these power structures like fuck this like weaponization of religion against women like as if women as if religion isn't solely existing to fucking hurt women but like um people are like oh my god you're saying bad things about men of color and i'm like yeah i don't give a fuck because what the fuck we just read she's like solidarity against women across racial lines i am totally there i would rather be thought of 
as being racist against men because I like called out shit that they're like, but that's their culture, but that's their ethnicity. I don't fuck. I don't give a fuck. You know who it's hurting? The women in that culture or that race or that religion group. That's what I fucking care about. Every single time there is like this, what do you call? Like, oh, what's the fucking word? Moral relativism? Is that the word I'm looking for? Like, a friend of mine was in a situation, um, like, last year, I think, where I think she was, she was in a class, or she had a friend who was in a class, or something like that, at a university, and they read something about, I can't fucking remember, but basically it was about something to do with, like, um, sexist institutions in sp some specific African country. And almost everyone in the class came away with the position of like, but if they're like Muslim, which was not mentioned, nobody mentioned the religion of any of the people in that country. If they're Muslim, like they should get to like practice their culture. And she was like, the whole point of the thing that they read was women are being hurt in this culture because of their own cultural practices. Like, let's think about it. What should we do about it? How is that bad for them? And the entire universal blanket response was, well, that's their culture. So we should just like accept that women in of non-white women in many ethnicities and different parts of the world, third world countries, whatever you want to call it, are just going to be fucked over forever because to otherwise is to like disrespect their culture. Uh, my view is that if their culture is hurting women, then like that's fucking bad. <laughs> um, Kitty Cat says it's because they're men. I hear this all the time from women in Awan, Indigenous, that if you really cared about women, you wouldn't stop speaking out about sexual violence when it comes to Indigenous men. Yes, exactly. In every, this is something that I think I read from Cherry Smiley, who is like an Indigenous feminist in Canada, but I might be confusing it with someone else. Pretty sure it was Cherry Smiley. She was like, in any community, when women are hurt, the number one person who's hurting them is the men in their own community. And that totally changed my way about the way I think about like confronting misogyny across race lines. Like, I don't care if you think I'm being like xenophobic or something because I'm like questioning a cultural practice that is specific to that region or ethnicity or religious group or whatever. What I care about is the women are being hurt and you're all just saying like, well, that's the way it is. We better not mess with that. Cause like they, it, it matters to them. Like, it's also just actually racist, I think, to be like, well, those cultures can't help themselves from hurting women, so we should just let them do it because it's like important to them. Imp hurting women is so important to them that to question it, you're attacking their culture. That's like, like, what? Like, I don't know, anyway. Possible person says, it's white culture to be racist and misogynistic. What a justification. The whole point of the conversation is to criticize and, cha and change culture. Yeah, exactly. So one of the, like, the core things that I'm comfortable with and have been like trying to think that way and speak that way and connect to women that way is that I have solidarity with women across racial, religious, ethnic lines above and beyond my care for how it's perceived that I treat the men of that culture. I don't know. That's where I'm at right now, based on what I've read from women of color who are feminists. Because, like, every single fucking time, it it's so glaringly obvious to me right now. Like, um, I've spent a lot of time in, like, Muslim-majority parts of Canada, and it's so fucking obvious to me, like... <clears throat> I've seen conversations where like Muslim girls, like teenagers, try to have conversations with each other about like the sexist limitations that are put on them because they're in like a Muslim family family and go to a school that's majority Muslim and like all that kind of stuff, right? And the reason the conversation goes nowhere is because the people around them, other women who think they're being feminist, are basically like, well, you know, multiculturalism, 
like women are trying to understand the situation they're in. And because people don't want to be like Islamophobic, they're stopping the women from actually talking about it and just exploring it and challenging like the way they were raised to have a deeper understanding of like the misogyny they're experiencing. Like it's it's fucking insane. It makes me so angry. Um yeah, I don't know. Anyway. So yes, solidarity across state lines, even if it uh, state <laughs> across race lines, even if it makes us look like we don't care about men of that really um, race. Yeah, way to let these women sink. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Puzzle person says, I outright dismay, dismiss any declaration like that meant to shut down discussion. If you can't break down the why, then I don't care. Yeah. Okay. The last section is called disaffiliation, deconstruction, and demolition. I mean, I kind of skipped over the... The feminism and whiteness, whiteliness section is like really dense and I'm tired. So we covered like part of it, but not all of it. Um, disaffiliation, deconstruction, demolition, that section. Basically, she's like thinking in circles doesn't have real world implications. That's how it summarized that entire section. That's when she starts like criticizing Sartre and well, this guy, this Franz Fanon's response to Sartre or whatever. And um, Foucault and all this crap. Yeah. Like, I think that you could, cons if you were not reading between the lines, you could read parts of this essay as her being postmodern, but she's not trying to say that if we think outside of race, race will disappear. She's saying if we think outside of race, we will have a deeper understanding of the situation and more options of how to confront the situation rather than being stuck in the groove that we can't get out of. She's not saying that if we think outside of race, then we can just like racism will be gone. And she's criticizing that position. Um, growing room is the last section, the shortest section. Basically she's like, we need to practice how to get out of whiteliness, like, you know, the paradigm behaviors and rule following that embraces, enables, and perpetuates um, white supremacy. And she basically is like, we need to do this by doing consciousness raising, which, as she mentions in one of her other great essays in this book, is about pattern recognition. So I think like generating our own pattern recognition based on the women of color around us that we can listen to we can make a really positive step towards trying to be anti-racist, at least in our own lives on like a one-to-one -one level. Um, yeah, I don't feel like this essay has solved racism or anything, but it's it's let us think about it a little more critically and that's always good. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Puzzle person says people really just think they can throw out words like that now to stop people from talking. Yeah, um, it's crazy too. Like one of the things that I think about, um, especially because I mentioned uh, how there's like the socially condoned anti-racist like rhetoric right now is like I have friends who are women of color who have been in situations where they're where it's like, okay, we're going to like combat racism or like talk about racism and then as women of color they say something that's like new or they challenge the way in which like the current like anti-racist rhetoric is actually reinforcing racism and everyone in the room is like oh well you're a racist like white people in the room are telling these women of color that they're racist for trying to like think things through in a more nuanced throw away or in a way that's based on their world experience rather than the world experience of the socially sanctioned anti-racist rhetoric and I'm like, so the actual impact of what happened in that room was a black woman stood up and said, I think that of it this way. And a bunch of white people told you to shut up because you're being racist. Good. Anti-racism, A plus. Good, good job, guys. Um, 
Yeah. Katie says, and when you stop talking, the system wins. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we've talked for like a fucking hour about this. Um, I need to go. Um, this was nice. Honestly, it wasn't that nice because I'm so tired. I feel like I wasn't super coherent. I feel like I rambled a lot and I apologize for that. Um, tomorrow, we're going to do the um, final recap of the essays of this book and then probably the introduction to the Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. But tomorrow, I have like a lot of work to do like between my jobs. So I'm not sure if we'll get to all of that depending on how tired I am. Um, yeah. All right. So thanks for tuning in. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Okay, puzzle person. I'm trying to end the stream. You're saying all this like super quotable shit. Puzzle person says, nuance is the death of dogma. And when dogma dies, the self-righteous ego feeling it collapses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye.